terrific. Excuse me, terrific. Let's uh, let's get started. Excellent. I will get us started. Before this hearing begins, I'd like to pass along some notes about the system we are using today. This hearing will be recorded and will be viewable via live stream on the committee website. Each participant has a control bar at the bottom of their screen that includes a mute button and a video on and off button. The view control buttons in the upper right of your screen control your personal view and can be switched between active speaker, active speaker with thumbnails and grid view. This is your individual view and will not affect anyone else or what the public will see during the official proceeding. Please note that the system's active speaker view will automatically switch to your camera a few minutes a few moments after you begin speaking. A timekeeper will monitor the time for this hearing and will be pinned to the first row of the grid view. To view the clock, please change your personal view to grid view. If you would like to insert something into the record, please. Right. This uh, meeting is being recorded. Middle East, North Africa, and global counterterrorism will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. As a reminder to the members, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with uh, House Resolution 8 and the accompanying regulation, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. Uh, I see that we have a quorum. Um, I will now recognize myself for opening remarks. Um, and pursuant to notice, we are holding a hearing on the ongoing conflict in Syria. A month ago, we marked 10 years since the Syrian people rose up to demand dignity, freedom, and a voice in shaping their government. In response, Bashar al-Assad waged a brutal crackdown with the help of outside support, ushering in a decade of conflict and counting, and spawning a proliferation of global terrorism. The struggle for the future of Syria has led to the deaths of more than 600,000 people and the displacement of more than 12 million both inside Syria and around the Middle East. The crisis has destabilized neighboring Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, and Turkey and threatened Israeli security. It has no doubt changed the region for decades to come. The civil war created a radicalizing governance vacuum that helped launch ISIS. Although ISIS has been effectively dismantled by the United States and more than 75 allies and partners, it and its global franchises remain a lethal threat. The United States must prevent a resurgence of ISIS, which would directly threaten regional stability, our European allies, and the American people. Recent headlines related to Syria, reports on Assad's use of chemical weapons, widespread economic misery, and obstacles to delivery of humanitarian assistance are agonizing reminders that the conflict is far from over and that the Syrian people continue to suffer. In the past few years, Ongoing fighting in Idlib plunged nearly a quarter of Syria's population into further humanitarian crisis. Increased strikes from Assad's forces continually set up potential clashes between Syria and Russia and Turkey. The de-escalation zone agreed to during the previous administration 
which saw the U.S. pull back from our Kurdish partners, was never fully implemented. And while the fighting has stalled, the conditions in Idlib remain dire. In February, the United Nations estimated that 13.4 million people in Syria required humanitarian and protection assistance, almost 20, a 20% 20 increase in one year. Additionally, approximately 5.6 million Syrian refugees throughout the Middle East require aid. On March 30th, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, announced more than $596 million in new humanitarian assistance for the Syrian crisis. I applaud this announcement. The United States must continue to aid the Syrian people and also advocate for unfettered humanitarian access, including by defending cross-border assistance. In addition to humanitarian concerns, the Syrian conflict affects other important U.S. national interests. The conflict allowed Iran to expand its influence throughout the Middle East. Russia has used a foothold in Syria to expand its political, military, and economic influence, reclaim, attempt to reclaim its status as a great power, and promote itself as an authoritarian alternative to the United States. Assad, Russia, and Iran continue to brutalize the Syrian people, violate ceasefires, and flagrantly disregard international law by attacking hospitals, schools, shelters, health clinics, and residential areas. On Monday, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons claimed that Assad retained sufficient chemicals to use sarin gas to produce and deploy chlorine munitions and to develop new chemical weapons. In the last decade, Assad has unjustly detained and tortured tens of thousands of Syrians, including Omar al shogre who joins us today. Assad also continues to imprison several Americans, including Austin Tice, who has been detained since August 2012, and Majid Kamamaz, who was arrested in February 2017. I look forward to working with the Biden administration to free Austin and Majid, as well as all Americans unjustly detained in the Middle East and around the world. Congress has sought to play a role in supporting the Syrian people and resolving the conflict through both humanitarian aid and the Caesar Civilian Protection Act. The legislation mandates additional sanctions on enablers of Assad, including anyone who does business with or provides financing to his regime, his intelligence and security services, or the Central Bank of Syria. The leverage created by the Caesar Act seeks to help end the Syrian conflict through a negotiated diplomatic solution, which is vital to stabilizing the Middle East, protecting U.S. interests in the region, and providing a better future for the Syrian people. This is the challenging environment in which the Biden administration must develop its Syria policy. Achieving a political resolution in Syria has bedeviled the previous two administrations, and President Biden's team faces difficult decisions and trade-offs in the coming months. Congress stands ready to support a strategy that will advance U.S. national interests, deliver dignity and peace that the Syrian people have bravely pursued for more than a decade. After 10 years, we must let the Syrian people know that this Congress has not forgotten them. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how we can realize these goals, and I will now yield to the ranking member for his opening remarks. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank uh, Aviva Albush for uh, her coordination. Uh, Mr. Chairman, she's done a great job getting this together. And uh, I want to thank you, Chairman Ted Deutsch, uh, for calling this very important hearing an extraordinary time in history. It's been over 10 years since the Syrian revolution began. Let us not forget that we saw play out in international media when thousands of brave Syrians shouting peaceful, peaceful were met with bullets, barrel bombs, and other unthinkable horrors. As I have said before, the Assad regime is illegitimate and should be replaced to benefit the people of Syria. I know how talented the people are of Syria, with American citizens of Syrian Lebanese heritage being business and political leaders in my home state of South Carolina with dynamic assimilation. The, there is no question uh, to this crisis, solution to this crisis so long as President Assad remains in power. Ten years later, it is clear that failing to act in Syria and failing to enforce red lines was a critical mistake that has led to devastating consequences and led to destabilization in the entire Middle East. In unleashing his reign of terror, Assad has been assisted by the Russians in the air and Iranian-backed terrorist groups on the ground. Attempts to work with both countries to resolve the conflict have only led to failure. After 10 years of atrocities, it's unfathomable that Assad, Russia, or Iran would be a part of any solution 
as they are the root of the problem. To respond to the tragedies of Syria, Congress has acted in a bipartisan way in passing the Caesar of Syria Civilian Protection Act. Last Congress, as chairman of the Republican Study Committee's Foreign Affairs Task Force, I was grateful to release a detailed report which included multiple recommendations to strengthen the Caesar Act and achieve a future for Syria free of the brutal Assad regime. Based on this report, I'm also grateful to introduce Stop the Killing in Syria Act in the 116th Congress. Additionally, I introduced a bipartisan Stop UN Aid for Assad, which would end the illogical policy of providing U.S. taxpayer support to UN entities in Syria, which were directly funding the Assad regime. This policy idea is not radical. It should be a common sense. It's actually first recommended by Ambassador Robert Ford, President Barack Obama's ambassador to Syria. As we speak, the Assad regime is ramping up its efforts to wipe out Idlib province, something they have promised to do before. Despite our important differences with Turkey, I am grateful that the Donald Trump administration worked with Turkey to stop the Assad regime's assault on Idlib last year. Yet, more must continue to be done to deter the Assad regime from an assault which creates the biggest refugee crisis yet in the history of the conflict, which threatens to again overrun Europe. This time, as always, is the time to act. How many more Syrians will lose their lives in communities before we act? Thank you to the witnesses for their time and expertise. It's a particularly helpful to have the honor of Omar Ashabri, a champion for the people of Syria, a courageous survivor of Assad's notorious Branch 215 prison with us today. And I thank him for his work and bravery for the people of Israel, of Syria. With that, I yield back to Chairman Ted Deutsch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Uh, I'll now introduce our distinguished witnesses. Uh, Dr. Lena Khatib is the Director of the Middle East and North Africa Program at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. She was formerly Director of the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut and co-founding head of the Program on Arab Reform and Democracy at Stanford University's Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. Her research focuses on the international relations of the Middle East, uh, Islamist groups and security, political transitions and foreign policy with special attention uh, on the Syrian conflict. Mr. Omar al Shogri is a Syrian public speaker, detention survivor, and current Georgetown University student. Mr. al Shogri was smuggled from prison and fled Syria at the age of 20 after being arrested and imprisoned for participating in demonstrations against the regime. He currently engages in awareness raising for the situation in Syria and leads the Syrian Emergency Task Force's efforts to advocate for the liberation of detainees as the Director of Detainee Affairs. And Ms. Jennifer Caparella is the inaugural National Security Fellow at the Institute for the Study of War, a position created to sponsor rising national security leaders. She previously led ISW Syria team before becoming Director of Intelligence Planning and then its Research Director. She is a graduate of ISW's Hertog War Studies Program. And she's written extensively on Syria, Iraq, Al Qaeda, and ISIS and regularly briefs military units preparing to deploy on a range of subjects, including Syria, ISIS, and Russia. We're glad to welcome her back to testify again before the subcommittee. I thank all of the witnesses for being here today. Uh, I now will recognize the witnesses for five minutes each, and without objection, your prepared written statements will be made a part of the record. Uh, Dr. Khatib, you are recognized. Mr. Chairman, Ranking member, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Let's remember that we are having this hearing partly because of U.S. disengagement on Syria over the past decade. This engagement prolonged the conflict and created a vacuum exploited by Russia and Iran. Today, I'm going to present 10 available options for U.S.-Syria policy, which must be pursued together. One. The performance of previous U.S. administrations showed that saying the right things about the Syrian crisis is not enough. Their decoupling of rhetoric from action hurt U.S. credibility in the eyes of enemies and allies. The Biden administration can rectify the mistakes of the past by linking words and deeds. Two, the Syrian conflict can only end 
through the United States initiating bilateral talks with Russia. Russia's intervention in Syria is driven by a desire for international and American recognition. Russia can accept sacrificing Assad's presidency in return for maintaining some influence for itself in Syria, both political and military. Russia is likely to accept the formation of a transitional government in Syria, not as an outcome of the UN peace process, but as the outcome of bilateral negotiations with the United States. Three, the US should ensure that the UN-led peace process continues, but this process must be reformulated to become the mechanism for implementation of a Russian-US brokered peace deal based on supporting the formation of legitimate political, military, and economic alternatives to the Assad regime. Four, the US must pursue a comprehensive strategy to limit Iran's intervention in the Middle East. Negotiations over the nuclear deal must not be separated from negotiations over Iran's regional role. Both need to run simultaneously. Five, the U.S. must maintain a military presence in northeast Syria. Withdrawing troops hands over the northeast to Iran-backed groups who would acquire resources like oil and make the border with Iraq porous, threatening U.S. assets and allies in Iraq. Six, ISIS continues to pose a threat to U.S. national security and the world. But the global coalition to defeat ISIS must widen its campaign into a comprehensive strategy going beyond military action to also cover social, economic, and political components, addressing the grievances that drive people to join groups like ISIS, like tensions between Arabs and Kurds. The US must also ensure that any governance model implemented in North Syria is transparent, effective, and inclusive of all ethnic groups. This would help lessen tension with Turkey regarding Kurdish-controlled government. Seven, the U.S. must engage Turkey to jointly support the Syrian opposition in Idlib. Eight, the U.S. must support Syrian civil society to push for accountability for war crimes. This prevents those convicted of war crimes from ascending to power once a resolution to the conflict happens. Nine, the U.S must hold the United Nations accountable regarding the distribution of aid inside Syria to prevent the Syrian regime from diverting aid to suit its interests. The US must also open direct channels with civil society inside regime-controlled areas to counter Iran's strategy of grassroots-level control. Finally, the US must maintain sanctions against the Assad regime and anyone associated with it, Syrian or not but must mitigate sanctions' indirect impact on people. Sanctions are necessary, but not sufficient to push the conflict to a close. Peace in Syria requires a comprehensive strategy that only the U.S. can lead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khatib. Uh, Mr. Alshogri, you were recognized for five minutes. Thank you for inviting me to give my testimony. I want to thank Chairman Deutsch, Ranking Member Wilson, Chairman Meeks, and Ranking Member McCall for their dedication to stopping the killing in Syria. Today, I'm sitting in the most democratic institution of the United States of America, the People's House, and I hope one day Syria will have one too. 10 years ago, when I was 15, the people of Syria began asking for democracy and representation. Inspired by the United States and its ideals, we all took to the streets singing for freedom and democracy. We went to the streets singing for freedom and democracy, and we were holding flowers in our hands. For my peaceful participation in these demonstrations, the regime detained and tortured me. They even pulled out my fingernails. I spent three years in prison alongside my, my young cousins, one of whom, Bashir, died in my arms after enduring years of torture. Months after my arrest, I learned that my father and two of my brothers were dead. My village, al Baida was in ruins. The Assad regime massacred my entire community. All of my childhood friends were dead. 
The Assad regime feared al-Baida's hope would spread to the surrounding cities, so they killed everyone they, they could find. The regime forces filmed their, even filmed their, their, their brutalities. Videos of them slaughtering the people of my hometown are everywhere. I have even found a video of them killing my own father. By a miracle, I escaped prison and reached Idlib, the remaining opposition sanctuary in Syria, which once was home to one and a half million people. Today, it houses four million civilians, about a million of them children. These people have done nothing wrong but ask for freedom and basic rights. Only in Idlib was I offered some care and protection until I was able to leave the country to seek medical treatment. Sweden thankfully gave me asylum. Today, I'm proud to come before you as a student at Georgetown University and Director of Detainee Affairs at the Syrian Emergency Task Force. I know that many of you have been committed to support the democratic aspirations of the Syrian people, and I have had the honor of meeting with many of you personally. So I want to thank you. I thank you for the Caesar Syria Civil and Protection Act 2019. I want to urge you to continue to ensure the full implementation of the act with a special focus on stopping the war machine of the Assad regime, Iran, Russia, and Hezbollah aimed against Idlib. If the existing ceasefire collapses and the Assad regime continues its offensive with conventional and chemical weapons, those four million civilians currently in Idlib will face detention, displacement, or death. And any prospect of negotiated settlement will be off the table. If we do not protect the people of Idlib, there will be mass humanitarian atrocities, eventually surpassing the numbers of Rwanda, significant levels of displacement, which could potentially double the number of refugees in Europe, and an increase in extremism. Extremist actors will manipulate the lack of actions in their own propaganda and recruitment efforts, presenting themselves as the only civilian defense line. If Idlib falls, Russia, Iran, and the Assad regime will then focus their efforts on North East Syria, increasing the challenge for U.S. force protection efforts and endangering U.S. partner forces. As former U.S. to Syria Ambassador Frederick Hoff said, an Assad victory would entrench Syria as the North Korea of the Middle East. By protecting Idlib, the United States, by, by, by protecting Idlib, the United States would effectively prevent Assad military victory, and in doing so, would be conducive to political solution and a negotiated settlement as per UN Security Council Resolution 2254. In January 2020, the Assad regime and its allies began to revamp their relentless offensive on Idlib, which resulted in massacres against civilians and the displacement of almost 500,000 people in a matter of a week. Fearing a massive flow of refugees, Turkey intervened, standing up to Russia and fighting against Iranian-backed militias, including Hezbollah and Assad forces. NATO troop presence in Idlib resulted in a fragile ceasefire that is on the verge of collapse today. The United States must support its NATO ally, Turkey, to ensure that this existing ceasefire in West Syria is maintained and made permanent. It can be done without sending additional troops to Syria. There is, there is four main areas the U.S. can, can bury ties and, and should. The U.S. must pursue and strengthen efforts for the immediate, uh, immediate cessation of attacks on Idlib civilians by engaging in military-to-military -military conversations with Turkey and providing them with logistical and diplomatic support. The United States must bolster its diplomatic efforts with Geneva to renew the al Hawa humanitarian border crossing and reopen Bab al Salam and al Yarabiya crossing to deliver humanitarian aid. The United States must step up support for existing independent civilians infrastructure in Idlib to, con uh, to counter the spread of extremist ideology and propaganda efforts. The United States must intensify and broaden Caesar Act accountability efforts. This war, ladies and gentlemen, began with civilians like me calling for freedom. It was inspired by you, the United States. We wanted Syria to be a country of the people, by the people, for the people. I'm honored to be sitting here today, but I do so with an enormous responsibility to convey to you the voices of the Syrian people, the thousands of civilians tortured to death in the Caesar photos, many of whose lifeless bodies the regime forced me to number, incumbent 
upon us that we save those who remain and we seek justice for those who lost. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. El Shogri. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Caffarella, you are now recognized. Chairman Deutsch, Ranking Member Wilson, and distinguished members of this subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today. I am honored by the opportunity to testify again about the devastating impact of Syria's now decade-long war and how the U.S. might better safeguard American interests while making an end to the violence possible. For 10 years, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has chosen to torture, execute, bomb, and starve his own people rather than grant even modest concessions. The OPCW just this week implicated his forces in yet another chemical weapons attack against civilians, this one in 2018. Assad's violence has upended the Middle East, caused instability to ripple across Europe, and inflamed the global jihadist movement. But today I'd like to shift focus to put Assad in his proper place within the Syrian war. Assad is resilient and capable, but he cannot alone determine Syria's future. The war being fought in 2021 is much different from the one that began a decade ago when Assad chose violence against peaceful protesters. The Syrian battlefield is now a tapestry of transnational military forces who are locked in a complex and multi-sided power struggle. Foreign forces, including the Russian and Turkish militaries, Iran's Revolutionary Guards or Quds Force and its foreign proxies, and various foreign jihadists, as well as U.S. forces, now control or influence much of the Syrian battlefield. An agreement between international actors is now a prerequisite for ending the conflict, but it's unlikely in the near term. Moreover, no actor currently fighting in Syria can seize and hold all of the country, and most are pursuing goals that are incompatible with a durable partition. The war will continue, with increasingly global repercussions and leaving behind the Syrians who rose up to reclaim their country and who still represent Syria's future. Policy goals that were reasonable in 2011 are no longer appropriate a decade later. The U.S. will not achieve a nationwide ceasefire in Syria, which has become a wholly discredited notion. A diplomatic settlement of the war is also out of immediate reach. Assad refuses to negotiate even now as his economy collapses and new unrest among loyalist communities emerges. His behavior indicates he believes time is on his side. America's habit of choosing unattainable goals in Syria has cost us opportunities to make an impact and has made us vulnerable to a number of strategic traps that would worsen the conflict. They include accepting Assad and lifting sanctions on his regime, supporting Syrian Kurdish independence, or the opposite extreme, abandoning our Syrian Kurdish partners to Turkey, normalizing al-Qaeda's offshoots, or most importantly, expecting Russia either to play a constructive role or to fail in Syria, including outsourcing counterterrorism or countering Iran to Russia, expecting Russia to deliver a diplomatic settlement that ends the war, or expecting Syria to become a quagmire that weakens Russia. The Russia traps are the most dangerous. Viewing Russia as a potentially constructive actor overlooks Syria's importance to Russia's global ambitions. Russia is using its military bases in Syria as a springboard to expand military infrastructure across the Middle East and North Africa. Russia's efforts to co-opt UN-led diplomatic processes are weakening international systems that would otherwise restrict Russia's malign activity. Empowering Russia in Syria is the same as strengthening Vladimir Putin's bid to make Russia a global power. These are not America's only options. Once we set aside unrealistic goals, more constructive options emerge. I recommend the following. First, reinforce our successes. The U.S. should reevaluate the stabilization and military assistance needed to bolster our partner in eastern Syria, the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF, and commit to providing cross-border humanitarian aid even if Russia vetoes approvals for it at the UN Security Council. Second, constrain US adversaries by upholding sanctions on Assad and his backers and continuing counterterrorism pressure against both ISIS and Al Qaeda. I recommend going even further to hold Russia accountable by commissioning a congressional study of Russian war crimes in Syria, Ukraine, and other theaters as appropriate. The US should also provide diplomatic and economic assistance to Turkey to prevent another attack on Idlib province. And third, the U.S. should build for the future. The U.S. should launch a robust diplomatic effort to foster dialogue across as much of Syrian society as possible while sidelining Assad and his backers. Support to the SDF in eastern Syria is also a vital component of building to the future and should include pressure on the SDF to reform its governance model to provide better political inclusion and accountability.
The U.S. has experienced the consequences of a decade of avoidance in Syria, and they're unacceptable. It is time to commit to engagement. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Caprella. Thanks to all of the witnesses for your really thoughtful testimony today. Uh, I'll now recognize members for five minutes each and pursuant to House rules. All time yielded is for the purposes of uh, questioning our witnesses. Uh, because of the virtual format of this hearing, I'll recognize members of members by committee seniority alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know. We'll circle back to you um, uh, after you let us know. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. Uh, I will uh, defer my time, so we'll start uh, by recognizing Mr. Connolly for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much, and thank you uh, for graciously uh, allowing me to go first. Um, and uh, let me first begin by saying, Omar, our hearts go out to you and your family. It, it's almost unimaginable the scale and scope of your losses, your personal losses, and those of mi millions of your countrymen and women. Um, it, it's a tragedy that is hard to encompass. Ms. Caffarella, I was intrigued by your critique, which I, I think is quite cogent, about sort of the, from the U.S.'s perspective, 10 years squandered. Although I'm struck by the fact that for the United States all along, in both the Obama and Trump administrations, um, it was very hard for us to figure out who are the good guys. Who is it we should support? Um, and uh, one thing you didn't address, and I, I would ask you maybe now to address it, um, and that's the role of Turkey. Um, the one ally we found that was willing to fight in the ground and actually had success were the Kurds. And of course, the Turks um, are paranoid about the Kurds establishing a military foothold that it can defend in the Idlib area. Uh, of Syria, and yet they're the only ones who really had military success in pushing back the caliphate and, frankly, in going toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, Syria, uh, with the Assad forces. So how does Turkey complicate this, um, and how can we try to engage them in a way that's more constructive and that isn't just focused on deterring or pushing back Kurdish gains that substantially have challenged Assad in that part of the country. Thank you, sir, for the question. It's an excellent and a very important one. Uh, I would frame Turkey as both ally and adversary in Syria. And I start there because I think it's important to recognize that the U.S. can't afford to treat him to treat the Turkish president as either just an adversary or just an ally. He is behaving in ways that are unacceptable for American interests, in part by driving the conflict by conducting ethnic cleansing, as you as you alluded to. However, the United States still needs Turkey, and actually Turkey is the largest supporter of remaining elements of the Free Syrian Army and other acceptable elements of the Syrian opposition. Turkey also intervened to prevent the massacre in the province that, that Assad and his backers were trying to conduct. The U.S. and Turkey still need each other in Syria. We are still aligned overall on the kind of outcome that needs to occur in order to end the conflict in Syria, which is a diplomatic resolution of the conflict that actually reconciles elements of the Syrian opposition. We need to get there. Uh, what I have offered is a series of first steps to realign the United States with Turkey, in part by providing it economic uh, and diplomatic assistance in Idlib. I also recommended in my written testimony that the U.S. begin discussions of what kinds of military support the Turks may need in Idlib, likely logistical support. And I think the U.S. also needs to work with Turkey to ensure that Russia does not succeed in ending the humanitarian aid access from Turkey into Syria. That should include access to our local partner in eastern Syria, the SDF, not just Idlib. But I think if the U.S. finds common ground with Turkey and is actually willing to support some elements of Turkey's policies in Syria, we will find there is more room to actually bridge between what the U.S. is doing in the east and what the Turks are doing in the north and, and farther west. It's difficult. It will take time, but that's where I would start. So thank you. One, one of the uh, conditions laid down by Turkey early on was that Assad had to go. Uh, 
that any peace agreement, any settlement had to be done without Assad. And often on the United States is tinkered with that as well. Does that remain a realistic goal in light of the reality on the ground? And how do we adjust to that in terms of ultimate contours of a peace settlement, even sitting down to try to talk about a settlement? Yes, sir. Thank you. I do think it is an important long-term goal, but I emphasize long-term. We will not get there in one year, two, or probably even three or four. In order to make that outcome more possible over time to enable some form of a transitional government to come into place, the U.S. needs to build back options to replace the Assad regime that Assad has destroyed since 2011. That starts by committing to support to our current partner, the SDF in the East, but also to supporting Turkey and its local partners. Long term, we need to align these structures, which actually represent governance and security structures that control most of the Syrian population outside of Assad's control, which is a significant component of Syrians. That also extends into the Syrian refugee population, which is not coming back to Assad regime controlled areas. Making Assad's departure from power possible starts with supporting the elements of the opposition that currently survive in Idlib, in the north and in the east, and realigning U.S. and Turkish policies. Thank you, Ms. Caparella, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Mr. Connolly. I'll now turn it over to the distinguished ranking member from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and gosh, this is an extraordinary hearing. I want to thank you, Chairman Joyce, for putting this together. Um, uh, it's so inspiring, the three witnesses we have. Thank you for what you're doing on behalf of the people of Syria, and I appreciate the bravery uh, that you have of presenting these points, uh, your insight of the witnesses, and, uh, and, and something that's very impressive. You have um, uh, truly unified people of both political parties in the United States uh, to share concern, uh, and I was just grateful to see the comments by Chairman Jerry Connolly. Um, we just want to express such sympathy, Omar, to your family, uh, but I know your family would be so proud to see how vocal you are, how articulate, and uh, how um, you're making a difference. And so I, I want to wish you well. And gosh, it's so important that we uh, work together uh, on behalf of the people of Syria. And I'm just uh, so grateful that uh, we have this uh, hearing today. Uh, with that, for each one of you, um, beginning with uh, Dr. Khalid, uh, why do you think the Biden administration has been reluctant to enforce the sanctions against the Assad, the murder Assad regime and impose new sanctions under the Caesar Act. Which sanctions could be implemented now? Thank you. On sanctions, I think all of them. Um, the sanctions that are currently discussed uh, are all urgent. Um, the Caesar Act especially, I think, could be widened and tightened. Um, there is no excuse to lift sanctions right now. There's a lot of lobbying uh, by Russia in particular, which unfortunately is having some echo even in places in Europe and the Arab world, uh, saying that sanctions are the reason behind the economic crisis in Syria. The reality is the sanctions are hurting the Assad regime, but the Assad regime is still able to find ways around them. So in my view, the sanctions are not just all implementable, but can be and should be tightened further. Thank you. Thank you. And our next, uh, Mr. Ali. Ashogra. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, um, um, ranking member. Um, and thank you for for your empathy um, regarding sympathy for my regarding my family, um, and I hope they are proud of me today. Oh, they um, are. Hey, they are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, regarding the sanctions, uh, since since the sort of the implementation of the Caesar Act, you noticed how the regime in Syria, as soon as the regime, you know, start talking about about any sanction hurting them, that means it's actually hurting them. It's not hurting the people. The regime is trying to market the, 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 the act as it's hurting the civilians of Syria. But who the ones who destroy the economy in Syria are clearly the ones who, who are killing its own people, right? So it's the Syrian regime. So we have the names that are have been sanctioned yet are those. How, answering this question of 
like how can these sanctions hurt the civilians? It's kind of easy. Just think about about names. Like how how would sanctioning the wife of the president who getting richer while the people in Syria getting getting in a worse situation would affect the civilians? And we have the, the Caesar Act, as you know, have have no sanctions on any any um, necessary needs for people on a daily basis. I I really I really think it's so important to to keep working on it. The COVID nineteen uh, pandemic has affected how fast the implementation of the act could be. But I, I really believe that limiting the resources the regime in Syria can have, it's really important to, to limit the number of the people dying every day. So it's, we should not just sanction people who are in Syria. That may be even less effective because the, the, the flow of money coming from outside, the Iranians, the um, and, and the Russians and other allies of the Syrian regime, those are the ones that we really should be targeted, uh, and that can be limiting the, um, the, the atrocities that's happening in Syria. Thank you. Thank you for your insight. And uh, Ms. Caffarella? Yes, thank you, sir. What I would only add briefly is I think the United States needs to consider the enforcement of secondary sanctions, especially against U.S. allies and partners in the Arab Gulf that have continued to normalize with the Assad regime and may be investing in Syria despite the U.S. sanctions and under significant pressure and enticement from the Russians. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And as I yield back, I want to thank uh, Chairman Deutsch. Uh, this is so impressive, the witnesses we have. Uh, and it is so refreshing to um, be working uh, with our colleagues across the aisle. Uh, this, uh, this is so important for the people of Syria. It's so important for the Middle East. Uh, and what opportunities we have. And so I look forward to continuing working with Chairman Deutsch uh, on these issues and our colleagues in a bipartisan manner. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Wilson. I, I concur fully and uh, appreciate the opportunity to work together on these really important issues. Um, next, I will yield five minutes uh, to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Uh, thank you, Chairman Deutsch and Ranking Member Wilson for uh, calling this hearing. Uh, to help us understand how we might uh, have more effective policy as it relates to Syria. And thank you to uh, the extraordinary witnesses for sharing your testimony. And in particular, I'd like to thank Ms. Ashogore, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, for uh, sharing your incredible story. And I too wanna convey to you my, my sympathy for the horrors you suffered and for the pain of loss uh, of your family. It's just incomprehensible to most of us. And, I think it underscores the urgency of getting our policy right and doing all that we can to end this regime. Um, but I want to focus for a moment on this, the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act, because I know um, sanctions have been put in place, but I'm interested to know from you, sir, what impact you think these sanctions are actually having on regime behavior and on the behavior of regime enablers and on the economy of Syria. And secondly, very few designations have been made for non-Syrian entities, uh, despite the fact that uh, outside backers were really the main focus of the legislation. And as we know, serve really as a lifeline to the Assad regime. And I know that's in part because the threat of sanctions has deterred some entities from engaging in sanctionable activity, but are there, but there are many non-Syrian uh, regime supporters who would be eligible for designation and I'm interested to know whether you would encourage the administration to use the Caesar sanctions more aggressively against non-Syrian, especially Russian entities. Mr. Ashagor, that's for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your sympathy. And I, at the task force, the organization I'm, I'm, I'm working at, we have designed an app called Syria Watch. And this app gives you notification on every attack happens on civilians in Syria and give you a short description of the, of, of, of the attack and what kind of attack and how many victims we have. Since we started the implementation of the Caesar Act, we have noticed the, the, the reduced number of attacks on civilians. And that's definitely affected by COVID-19. The regime had to create a new strategy, but also I'm sure affected by the regime limitation to have access to, to fuel their death machine. So I definitely encourage uh, the, the US administration to aggressively use the Caesar sanctions uh, 
against those who are supporting the Assad regime in Syria, because we know the economy in Syria is not great enough to fuel itself, its own death machine, right? So they need external actors, and they're betting on, they're betting on something, uh, especially the Russian. The, the Syrian regime without the Russian probably would have fallen a long time ago, because the Syrian opposition took over most of the country in 2014. And then we get the Russians bombing the civilians in 2014, 15. And that's how they actually managed to, um, to, to gather people in Idlib. And people in Idlib right now are in danger. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Kefarella, um, I know you spoke about our relationship with Turkey, that they're both an adversary and an ally, and it's a complicated relationship. But I know um, there has been reporting that uh, 200,000 Syrian Kurds were displaced in Northeast Syria by the invasion by Turkey, including local humanitarian staff who have been really giving important life-saving assistance and including as many as 70,000 children. So I'd like to know what is the status of those displaced by Turkey's invasion? Is the ceasefire durable? And um, is there a significant risk that fighting could break out between the SDF and Turkey in this region once again? And how do we how do we uh, engage with Turkey in a productive way and also honor, I think, our responsibility to the Kurds who are such a critical partner in our fight to defeat ISIS in that region? Thank you, sir. Uh, to my knowledge, those who were displaced by the Turkish incursion, uh, actually all of the Turkish incursions, remain displaced. Uh, and so this is a very vulnerable population that is not able to return to their homes. The ceasefire, I do not think, is durable over the long term. Uh, and I say that because we only reached it by placing significant leverage on the table against Turkey, which included threats of sanctions against high-level Turkish officials. That was important for changing Erdogan's calculus about what he could achieve in Syria, on what timeline, and with what cost. I emphasize that because the way to shape Turkey's behavior in Syria and to find opportunities to realign as allies is to actually recognize that this is power politics. This is not allies collaborating in a war zone. This is power politics. And I testified last year that I think the United States needs to learn from how the Russians have successfully navigated a relationship with Turkey. They're on opposite sides of the war, and yet they've been able to find consensus on a number of issues because they understand the leverage game that they are in and they are both acquiring and using leverage over each other to change their decision calculus. We need to do the same with Turkey. It's possible, and they do think by applying more leverage, including reinforcing our relationship with the SDF and signaling clearly that we will not abandon those Kurdish partners and their Arab allies, and that we are also serious about ensuring that the Turks will not extend their incursion further, that actually gives us leverage, and it enables us to reapproach very tough negotiations that we do need to have with our NATO partner in coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cicilline. Mr. Perry, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member for, for hosting this hearing and for having it. Uh, this is an intractable issue and subject, and, and uh, this is really informative. This is great. Uh, Mr. Omar, um, your testimony brings to makes real the things that we have heard in the past and, and uh, as horrific as it is, and it is indeed horrific. Um, it's important for your story to be told to to the world. And I, I thank you and I acknowledge uh, how painful it must be to continue to talk about these things, but to encourage you to continue to discuss them so the world uh, can see what has happened. And so we're, we thank you for your presence. Um, Ms. Carafella, you know, I, I'm looking for, and I, I've looked through your six points, and I, I think you're uh, realistic in your assessment uh, as a representative, as, as each of us are uh, of the American people. We're looking for, we have to respond rightly so to our constituency and say, well, this is the goal. This is why America is here. This is our interest in being here. And I want to talk to you particularly about the military, the United States military presence in Syria. And is there is the, is is there a way to diminish our presence and not diminish our effectiveness? Is it absolutely necessary in your opinion over the short or long term 
to have uniformed service members of the United States military serving in Syria? Thank you for the question, sir. In the near term, I do believe, actually, I assess that it is necessary for the U.S. to sustain our uniformed military presence on the ground in Syria. The reason I assess that is because upon an American withdrawal from Syria, the vultures who are currently circling our local partner, including the Russians, the Turks, the Assad regime, the Iranians, ISIS, and actually even elements of al-Qaeda, will pounce, and they will attack the SDF, and it will fail. However, I do think the most important use of American military forces in Syria are to create the security conditions within which the U.S. can help improve the capability of the SDF to be less reliant on the United States over time, to create a platform for humanitarian assistance and development aid to actually stabilize the area, and then to broker an agreement with Turkey that actually normalizes that relationship and enables the U.S. to scale back down our military pressure. The approach of buy with and through a local partner has been extremely successful at a relatively low involvement of U.S. forces in defeating the Islamic State and making this opportunity possible. But if we bail now, we will fail to actually convert that opportunity into an enduring outcome. It is not the time. I do not think that the United States needs to withdraw. And I think with a relatively limited further investment, we actually can make a sustainable withdrawal possible in the medium term. All right, now, and continuing on that line, because I think that's uh, that's a measured and, and well thought out approach, but, you know, folks like us, we have to have some expe expectation, and I think it's, it's it's appropriate that we see the light at the end of the tunnel. So while you talk about, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, you know, I think limited or for some period of time, what do you assess are the metrics, okay? And I know that I'm putting you on the spot, right? This is tough stuff. What do you assess are the metrics and what kind of, without advertising, because I don't think it's appropriate to advertise to your adversaries or your enemies what your timeline is, but some kind of a expectation of how long. So what are the metrics and how long do we expect, would you expect if you could make an assessment on broad terms to be, have a military presence in Syria? Thank you, sir. And I would just add, I think it is vital to sustain pressure on the United States to have a clear strategy that includes what does the end of this look like, right? When do we come home? I think that's vital. And I think that's how we avoid Syria becoming the Afghanistan, you know, of the future in terms of a U.S. policy disaster. What I would say is the metrics need to include what the anti-ISIS coalition actually already uses, which is that local forces are capable of preventing an ISIS breakout success and actually providing uh, durable security uh, for the local population that includes, you know, law enforcement and that kind of thing. That is within reach. The SDF is an incredibly capable partner, considering that we built it essentially from nothing, um, as ISIS had destroyed much of what was there in eastern Syria. So I would say establishing those security conditions is the first, and then establishing a diplomatic uh, settlement, not necessarily of the war overall, because again, I don't think that's possible in the near term, but we do need a resolution between Turkey and either the broader PKK network that applies to Syria or more limited Turkey and the SDF. I think that's possible. And the time frame I would offer, recognizing that time frames are the most difficult thing to, pre to predict in war, uh, where I would start is five years. And I think if the United States pursues this for five years but has continued to fail to generate these options, then it very much, or these outcomes, then it is time to reevaluate. Thank you. All right. And with the chair's indulgence, and I would just say five years is longer than I was hoping for, but I appreciate your candor. One last question. The UN, the UN's role, um, and, and, and when you talk about power politics, I agree with you in this instance. This is absolutely what this is, and I don't exclude the UN from that. Um, we have adversaries there in Russia and China that are not going to be helpful, especially in, in uh, reauthorizing 2533, as I understand it. How can the U.S. leverage the U.N. and understanding the complete circumstances of the U.N. Uh, to further our, our goals and our outcomes, uh, our, our, you know, our described outcomes in Syria? Uh, and thanks, thanks, uh, Mr. Perry. And the witness can give uh, a brief answer, and then we'll go to Mr. Malinowski. Brief, I promise. What I say on the timeline is I'm under-promising and hoping to under-deliver here. So th I think the goal is less than five years, but I'd set that benchmark. In terms of the UN, where I would start is by applying much more pressure in naming and shaming Russia 
for the malign role that it actually is playing inside of Syria. I recommended a congressional study of Russian war crimes. I think the U.S. should do whatever it can to raise pressure against Russia in the United Nations, in Syria, in Ukraine, on essentially all of the front lines that Putin is using, because Putin's campaign is also global. He acquires leverage in other theaters and then uses it uh, to accomplish other objectives. I think actually putting attention to what the Russians are actually doing in places like Syria is essential because it cuts through the Russian disinformation, which is Russia's one of Russia's most effective tools, including at shaping the United Nations. We need to do much better, and I think that starts by simply telling the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Of course, thank you, Ms. Uh, thank you, Ms. Caprella. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Mr. Malinowski, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and, and I want to start by thanking uh, Ms. Caparella for under-promising. And, and, and I actually think you, you, you've made a couple of points that I think are, are, are extremely wise and that, that we, should, we should think about beyond this hearing, um, particularly that, that the United States needs to be more comfortable embracing achievable goals. In, in situations like this. I think one of our problems as a country, uh, whether uh, in how we've addressed Syria or Afghanistan or Libya or any of these complex situations in, in that part of the world is that, you know, being Americans, we wanna solve the problem. And sometimes if we can't solve the problem in a limited period of time, we walk away. And we forget that the difference between doing something and only 50,000 people die, and doing nothing and half a million people die is a lot of death and destruction and suffering that is avoidable, even if the best possible outcome with our full engagement is still something that is messy and lousy and unsatisfying. So I think that is a, a, a very good frame for approaching what we, we should have been doing in Syria and what we can do going forward. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about Idlib. Um, you and I had an exchange, I think, at the last hearing uh, about, uh, I think at the time we were talking about a proposal to deploy Patriot missiles to, to Turkey uh, as a means of establishing perhaps even a de facto no-fly zone uh, over that part of, uh, of Syria. Uh, where would you be right now in terms of you know, the most aggressive, realistic measures that the United States could take to provide some protection with Turkey, with others, given all the complexities, um, uh, protection to the civilian population suffering from airstrikes. Yes, thank you for your continued attention to the crisis in Idlib. Uh, I would say I'm essentially in the same place as I was a year ago. Uh, I would defer to Turkey on what specific requests that it has at this time, because um, it has been able to strengthen its military position since we last spoke. But I do believe that a no-fly zone or the equivalent uh, that prevents the Syrian regime from conducting barrel bomb attacks and disrupts Russian air uh, is essential in Idlib. Uh, I would say that it is a difficult proposition to make, I understand, given the other global force posture requirements that the United States has, including with China and with Russia. But in that context, I think it's vital to recognize that Idlib is actually one of the most violent and potentially dangerous front lines between NATO and Russia. That's what we're talking about here. I, I don't actually think there is a more volatile front line, except for possibly Eastern Ukraine, uh, given the Russian buildup, that the U.S. could use as a pressure point against, against Putin. And again, that has global ramifications. So I would still provide that kind of support. And I would emphasize again, the necessity of the humanitarian aid inside of Idlib, which is really the most unsustainable element of the crisis in 2021. Right. Thank you. So talk about that a little bit. Practically speaking, if we can't overcome the Russian veto on cross-border, what practically speaking can and should be done? So I have recommended a trilateral deal between the United States, the EU, and Turkey to provide humanitarian aid independent of the UN. Um, as has already been mentioned in this hearing, the UN aid is already co-opted by the Assad regime. And what Russia is trying to do is give Assad a monopoly over that aid. We need to ensure that doesn't happen. And we need to ensure that doesn't happen without punishing all of the Syrian civilians outside of regime held Syria. We can do that. The Turks have interest in doing it. I think we need to make sure it also does include our local partner in the east who the Turks might still want to choke off. Uh, but I would recommend that trilateral deal as a start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, for, you know, for maybe I want to direct this to Omar. One of the 
extraordinary things about this situation is we're talking about a country, maybe a quarter of its population is now living outside of its, its homeland. Um, and that's probably going to be the status quo for some time. What, what can be done by the United States, our allies to invest more in the development of that Syrian diaspora, its education, its development, so that one day it is more ready to come back to Syria and contribute to the rebuilding of the country. Thank you, Congressman. I believe education is the best thing we can invest in, in people in, in the Syrian people who are who left the country and in people in Syrian people who are uh, internally displaced, like in people um, who lives in Idlib. Um, the, the regime will fall. It, it will take years, but the regime will fall, and then we, we would have the responsibility to rebuild our nation. Um, and we cannot rebuild this nation without having an education, without you know being supported. So what we do at the task force is we already started uh, um, a school for orphans and women's center uh, inside Syria, where we can support those young, this young generation so they can be ready when the regime falls so they can rebuild it. And actually, it's people from our Kansa, you know, sponsoring this, uh, this, this school we, we're driving. It's very important. That's why I decided to apply to Georgetown University, because I, I knew that at some point I will be part of rebuilding Syria. I cannot just sit and blame this country or this country for helping or not helping. I need to take personal responsibility, and I need somebody to help me take this res personal responsibility, right? So all the, all the flexibilities I get around me of being supported by a congressman, which makes it easier to be supported by the people who voted for you, right? So all this support I'm getting to be educated and to, to, to be guided in my life. Everybody needs a guide, right? If the same people need those guides, that will, that will really manage to, um, that will manage to, to rebuild their country. And we have so many, local councils inside we the same people have been awesome in creating organizations and and councils inside and outside syria so supporting those councils and organizations is so important to create a body that can actually lead syria when the regime fall thank you thank you and you're back uh thank you mr malinowski um and uh, thanks very much uh mr Oshargri, for that great answer uh mr kinzinger you're rep you're uh, recognized for five minutes uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, I think the point that uh, Mr. Malinowski made is is important, which is going into things with realistic goals. It's the challenge, you know, we face in as a self-run government, where you know, in order to get, in essence, the American people to buy in on any kind of military action or foreign policy, uh, you have to have big goals. And I think there is a point. Uh, that we need to understand whether it's a president kind of selling the reason, so to speak, for involvement or engagement uh, to do it in a realistic way with a realistic outcome. But I think, you know, another important part to remember is we live in a moment where with information, you know, the ability, for instance, of, of terrorists to recruit now, besides having to meet them, you know, in a dark room and they may be a government agent, maybe not. Now it can all be done on the Internet. It's just a different world we live in. And. And I think we all need to come to grips with the fact that, you know, we have a choice as Americans. We are either going to be involved in the world, uh, and that's going to include uh, sometimes making some sacrifices, uh, or we're going to choose to not be involved in the world. And that's going to mean that we are, in many cases, in this new world, a victim of things that come to our shores. I think of Afghanistan. I'm sure we'll have a hearing on that at some point. I certainly hope. Uh, and so it's a, it's a big challenge, but I, this is an important hearing. And I, you know, now that we're 10 years uh, of the war, I, I want to reflect real quickly on some failed policies. So both administrations, the international community, and even Congress have really failed to hold Assad and his backers accountable. We took too long to pass the Syrian Civilian Protection Act. People suffered as a result. We didn't enforce red lines on the use of chemical weapons. People died. Of course, there's new news about that today. Uh, and it's my hope that the current administration does not, you know, repeat the same failed policies regarding Syria as the prior two. Uh, so, Omar, it's great to see you. Uh, I, I want to say, you know, as I've talked to you in the past, uh, your story is one of the most inspiring uh, yet daunting ones to emerge from the Syrian conflict. Uh, 
Uh, I want to let you know that we will continue to do everything in our power to ensure that all those responsible for these human right abuses from Assad down to the most junior prison guard will answer for their crimes. And it's my hope that that's sooner than later. So let me ask you, over the past few months, we've seen the we've seen Assad attempt to normalize his relationship with the international community. Uh, what message do you have uh, for those nations looking to provide a lifeline to the regime? This regime has killed not only my, my father and brothers and, and killed my childhood friends, but it killed everybody I knew in my hometown almost. And uh, it killed the dream of so many Syrian children, adults, women, men, and everyone. And just returning to normalizing the relation with the regime means that you accept all the crimes and you support all the crimes that the Syrian regime has committed against those people. And you deny our rights to democracy and freedom. And just by getting back normalizing the relation with them, that means you are one of those who sponsor the death of the Syrian people. You will be responsible when you when you normalize your relationship, that means you support, which means one day we will, the Syrian people, we're following all of that, and one day we will be asking you questions in court just for supporting this death machine. So that's my message. Thank you. Let Thomas. me ask you just real quick, if, if you could give me a real quick answer, because I have a question for Dr. Caparella. It, are you more likely to become, is, is a person more likely to become a terrorist under a brutal dictator or under a free democracy? Omar. Yes. Oh, I, I will tell you, I will tell you from, from, from friends I had. Um, I, I have friends who, who went fighting with ISIS against the Syrian regime. And guess why? Because they lost their parents, their friends, their school, their life. They had nothing left, like nothing left to live for. The only thing they wanted to do is to commit brutalities against the regime that took everything from them. They didn't care if ISIS was right or wrong. What they want to do is to do what the regime done to them. They did not. I had a friend who, who did not care about ISIS values or no values. He just wanted to see the most brutal party to engage with, to kill the regime, because they got nothing left to care about. They got nothing left to live for. And, and that's important to understand. We cannot let people suffer in Syria. That automatically will present those terrorist actors as the only you know, force that's you know, aiding those people, protecting those people, or giving them an option to fight against the regime, right? Thank you, Congressman. Well, thank you, really Dr. Well, Dr. Caprell, I have some questions I'll submit for the record, but I thought uh, I would let Omar go because I think that's a very important point. So thank you, everybody, for being here, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kinzinger. Uh, Ms. Manning, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for this incredible hearing. Uh, Mr. Alshogre, I want to start for you with you. I want to thank you for your tenacity and your bravery. And you have given us the most hopeful and uplifting response when you talked about the importance of educating Syrian youth who are now scattered so that they'll be ready to go back and build their country when the Assad regime falls someday. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your efforts and tell us is there a network of others who are working around the world to educate Syria, the Syrian diaspora uh, to maintain the culture and the connections so that they will be ready to go back uh, and rebuild as you've described? Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for your question. I, um, I believe there is so many organizations that can be supported. Uh, but as I, as I am a part of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, I will tell you more about, about what we do. Um, hopefully you heard something about Rukban camp, a camp on the Syrian, Jordanian, and Iraqi border with 10,000 people, majority of women and kids. They got nothing there. It's the desert. They got very limited access to water and food and all of that. And there is di big difficulty to access this camp, right? The only reason those people are still alive, not attacked, are is because of the Syria, because of the American 
troops presence in, in the region because there is this area the regime won't attack because of because of the American troops ne nearby. So what we did is we invested in those people. We opened a pharmacy and we tried to give them some education. We, we have online education today. You know, this, this pandemic gave us an opportunity to focus on online education. And we have this access. If we, so the only thing we needed to do is to provide people with some internet connection so we can actually provide them with some, some tools so they can educate themselves. There is many organizations, there is Syrian campaign, there's Turquoise, there is small, you know, I love to support those small organizations run by young people like me, because I think we are the future. Well, you are very important for us too, but we still, we are the future. We're the ones that are gonna lead. And especially if talking 10 years, 20 years, um, there's so many, one of the important things I wanna mention is the importance of the European countries in educating the Syrian people. And I recently seen that statistic in Sweden, the second biggest number of, of people in your Swedish universities are Syrians. That makes me proud, which is awesome, you know. The process is still, you know, kind of slow though, because you gotta stay one year, two years before you get your residence permit to be able to go to school. This two years kind of important you can't just freeze for two years. So that can be simplified. I don't know exactly how it is in the U.S., but I think in the U.S., if you manage to find a job, if you manage to, to, um, to sponsor yourself, you can educate yourself, which is really good. So I, I would encourage the U.S. And the U.S. government to, to, to invest in those small organizations. Like the task force, our budget is, is $200,000 a year. And we do work. We have a beautiful team. Smart people working for free because they care about the Syrian case. You know, such organization actually operating to, to provide education, food, water, advocacy, legal work for thousands and thousands of Syrian people. The Rukban camp, some people in Idlib and people outside, all of that. Such organizations need to be supported. We cannot just expect them to do a great job all the time. If they got no money, right? Our operation cost is almost zero. We have nothing except when we go in the fancy time we go for lunch together. That's all expenses we have. Otherwise, we're using all the donations we're getting just to support, you know, the people on the ground in Syria. Such organizations deserve to be supported. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you for your, your enthusiasm and your optimism. Uh, Ms. Caffarella, I'm going to ask you, you've talked about all the players in the region except for one. Is there a role for Israel to play in all of this? Thank you, ma'am. So far, the Israelis have actually been quite successful inside of Syria, and that reflects in part the fact that they have established their own reasonable and attainable goals. They're not trying to do too much, but they have stabilized the security situation in some important respects on the border of the Golan Heights, in part by investing in local communities through a very successful operation that was known as Operation Good Neighbor. And the Israelis have also scaled up their military pressure on Iran as Iran has tried to go further to build out a permanent military infrastructure inside of Syria. Those two elements of Israel's role in Syria are important and should, in my view, continue. I think asking Israel to do more is probably less helpful uh, in the near to medium term because the Israeli security interests are currently being addressed. And I think what the United States needs to do is to now step in and provide support to Israel um, in ways that augment and help to make permanent the effects that the Israelis have already been able to create. Thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank, thank you very much, um, Ms. Manning. Mr. Mast, uh, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Caffarella, I wanna go back in a minute to something that you were talking about, uh, about Israel and the IRGC. Uh, but before that, I wanna touch on something that you had brought up in your remarks, and it was about the loyalist populations for Assad being uneasy, having unrest, you know, wanting to see change beyond sanctions. What price are you putting on them beyond that to, to help move that ball? Thank you for the question. Where I would start is actually with my recommendation to convene a intra-Syrian dialogue that includes as much of Syrian society as possible. I think it's important not to overstate how much pressure there actually is internal to the regime. It's not going to oust Assad. It's not going to cause a rapid destabilization, but it has created a wedge. And I think we need to exploit that wedge both by keeping the pressure on, 
but by inviting elements of the Alawite community and other Syrian minorities that have remained loyal to Assad into more track two initiatives. I think this is a perfect role for the United States to play, and it can make a diplomatic settlement of the war possible in the longer term by creating the kinds of conversations among Syrians that the Russians, the Assad regime, and the Iranians are actually preventing from occurring. So, so again, ma'am, at the, the tail end of your last comments, you spoke a little bit about the IRGC and about Israel. Um, and I think it maybe even been, may have been minimized to some degree. You talked about how they ramped up uh, the IRGC ramping up their military efforts. I tracked them at at least 130 plus bases uh, across Syria. That's not a, a minimal presence. And I think most of us on this committee realize that. And, and I want to kind of take that and move that over to you, Omar because you've been so forthcoming with your personal experiences. And I'd ask if you could be forthcoming with what you've seen so viscerally as it relates to the IRGC and their presence across Syria. A few, a few excuse me, Congressman, I wouldn't have a comment about that. Thank you. Can you say that one more time? I apologize. I, I won't have a comment about that. Thank you. Okay. Well, in that then, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Mass. Uh, I believe Mr. Sherman has uh, joined. Mr. Sherman, you're recognized. Why, well, thank you. Our hearts are moved by the people of Syria. We want to help. Talked to a number of Syrian American activists uh, who have focused uh, on, on Human Rights Watch, and they have some concerns because the uh, uh, the Syrian government has developed a policy and legal fr framework that allows it to co-opt humanitarian assistance uh, and uh, use it to fund its own atrocities to advance its interests, to punish those who it perceives as its opponents and to benefit its loyalists. The government's uh, regular restrictions on access of humanitarian organizations to communities that uh, are in need um, gives the government uh, more control, allows the government uh, to uh, steal aid and, and, uh, and, and sell it and siphon it off. Uh, Dr. Khatib, uh, how can uh, the U.S. reduce Assad's leverage over humanitarian assistance, uh, particularly in Idlib? Uh, I've been aware that a number of U.S.-based 501c3 organizations, charities, uh, are already working on the ground in Syria, and I wonder whether they would be uh, conduits for our humanitarian assistance uh, that can help the people uh, without uh, going through Assad. Thank you very much. Um... As mentioned by uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Ferrella earlier, there is a way to work directly with organizations through Turkey, uh, organizations that are Syrian or international that are not the UN. But at the same time, I think the US should hold the UN accountable. The Assad regime does not only have pressure over where the UN directs its aid, sometimes the Assad regime even influences recruitment within UN agencies in Syria so that the people responsible are selected by the Syrian regime. And the regime basically sometimes refuses to give UN staff permits to work in Syria if it does not approve um, of their presence and work. And therefore, I think when it comes to aid, there's, there's two separate tracks. One is working uh, on a micro level and sometimes several steps removed to get aid uh, to cross through Turkey into Syria, but at the same time, the issue of UN accountability is very important. Thank you. Moving toward the UN and, it, and accountability, UN Security Council Resolution 2254 remains the cornerstone of the political process in Syria. Under its authority, the UN has established the uh, Syrian Constitutional Committee uh, in uh, 2019. Uh, we hope that's a step forward. Uh, it includes uh, Syrian uh, civil society groups, opposition groups, government officials, neutral legal observers. Uh, but the Assad regime has essentially ignored and obstructed the, the UN process um, and uh, likely believes that it's in power 
apart, apart from applying uh, more pressure on the regime, what can the U.S. do uh, to uh, strengthen uh, the uh, uh, Geneva process? I wonder which of our witnesses is most anxious to uh, comment on that question. Uh, if I may, I would ahead. like to say thank you. I wrote about this in my written statement as well. Unfortunately, the regime and Russia view the UN-led peace process as going nowhere. They are not taking it seriously. They are deliberately stalling it. They want to show that this is all a waste of time and that ultimately the world should normalize relations with Assad. That's why they want it to fail. So it's very important not to let it die. However, I stress that in my view, we cannot rely on the UN peace process to kickstart peace in Syria, even though it is meant to be a peace process. I think the issue of Syria is now also not in the hands of Syrians, unfortunately, as a first step. It has become an international conflict. It has allowed Russia to present itself as uh, a new emerging superpower once more. And that is why I advocate that the United States start bilateral negotiations with Russia on Syria. There are certain things, some concessions that the US can offer Russia that would not hurt US national interests, uh, such as having Russia retain a naval base on the Mediterranean or having Russia retain a degree of political I'm, I'm or military see if we have, influence have, in Syria. We have, have time to have uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Alsho uh, Gari uh, also comment uh, on that question. I believe I believe in the importance of, of the UN's role in, in, in the Syrian um, in the Syrian issue. Um, there is there was a big purpose of creating the UN. Uh, that was to create to, to make the world safer, to make the world better. Um, and right now, I believe that the bureaucratic system or the wrong leadership maybe in the UN is affecting how how well they're doing it. Um, that the Syrian people need to be supported on the ground. Um, and, and that, can be, that can be done in multiple ways. Uh, now we notice that the aid going from the UN through the, the Syrian regime, uh, through the Syrian regime, that, that happened many times in the regime that sees, see, you know, seizing people, killing people, can't actually be giving the aid to, uh, to give back to the people, right? So if those people are seized to be starved by the Syrian regime, we, we can't give aid to the Syrian regime. So that needs to be changed. Those people on, on the ground in Syria need to be uh, need to be supported directly to them through their local organizations. Um, thank you for that. And I I, I wonder um, okay. I have faced some technical issues. I did not hear. Okay, uh, I, I, I do want to. My time is expiring, and I just want to add one final comment, and that is we have to remember that the Assad regime exists because Iran supported it, particularly at the beginning of this conflict. And then when we look at hundreds of thousands of dead Syrians, we know uh, that uh, the arrow points to Tehran. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sherman. Uh, Mr. Burchett, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Deutsch. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, what are the operational? Mr. Burchett, I think you. Muted yourself. Actually, I unmuted myself, and I think y'all muted me. So, um, sorry to correct you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me start over. What are the operational capabilities of the Syrian government forces, and does Al Assad enjoy the support um, of the soldiers under his command, or is he completely reliant on the Russian and Iranians for support? I'm happy to offer some comments on that, sir. Um, Assad's ability to control elements, surviving elements of the Syrian Arab army is actually quite small. There are some Syrian units that remain that remain coherent and that do remain loyal to Assad. However, many elements of the pro-regime forces that exist on the battlefield and that are most decisive are either stood up by Russia and Iran or have been co-opted by Russia and Iran over the course of this war. So the amount of combat power that Assad can independently generate is actually quite low. Now, that doesn't mean that Syrian forces, unfortunately, aren't loyal to Assad. He remains a cult of personality and has convinced 
um, remaining elements of his force that he is their only option. Uh, however, I do think it's important to keep into perspective as your question so astutely does uh, what Assad can independently do versus what his backers make possible. Thank you. Okay. Um, what What's the status of the UN backed Constitutional Committee and are the elections uh, and the elections in Syria? I know. Um, I know Mr. Sherman had mentioned that earlier, and I, but I wonder if there's if somebody could further delve into that. I would be happy to, sir. Um, the Constitutional Committee held five rounds of talks. There is going to be a sixth round. Uh, the UN envoy expressed frustration with the way this process is going, and this is um, again being stalled because of the behavior of the Assad regime. It is not cooperating. It is using it to just waste time to show that anything affiliated with the UN peace process uh, is dead, unfortunately. So unless there is a significant change in the work plan, uh, it's not likely that the uh, Constitutional Committee is going to come up with a new constitution in the near future. When it comes to elections in Syria, Assad is planning on being re-elected in summer 2021 when presidential elections happen. Uh, so far for Russia, it regards itself as winning uh, in Syria and therefore uh, is not seeing an alternative to Assad, so therefore would be happy if he is re-elected. However, I stress that Russia will be willing to sacrifice Assad if it sees that there is a compromise to be done internationally. And that's why the weaker Assad is, the more Russia benefits because it can influence what happens in Syria in a greater capacity. But this also gives, I think, the United States in particular, a diplomatic opportunity so that it can influence Russia to then take the UN peace process seriously. I stress the UN peace process is important, should continue, but it's not effective because Russia is not taking it seriously. So we need to pressure Russia and negotiate with it at the same time. Thank you. Uh, anybody else on that? If there's time, I'd love to comment. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. So well, I agree uh, with what my colleague just briefed in terms of the fact that, unfortunately, the UN-backed process is essentially right now dead in the water. Uh, the U.S. does need to maintain the UN as the legitimate vehicle for a diplomatic settlement, and there will need to be a Russian role in that future settlement. What I would offer is that it is vital that the United States ensure that those negotiations do not happen on Putin's terms. Putin does not seek to come to the negotiating table. He seeks to force us to come to his table, which will be rigged, if not to keep Assad the man in power, to keep the system in power, and to safeguard Russian interests, which again in Syria are actually part of his global military leverage. I think the United States needs to consider what additional leverage we need to place on Russia rather than what concessions we can offer him. And I think the United States needs to reiterate the basic components of what a negotiated settlement would require, which Syrians have often in the past included as a condition the withdrawal of foreign forces, which of course Russia is not going to be willing uh, to do, but I think it's important actually not to just cede at the outset of negotiations. We need to use it as leverage. Thank you. Okay. Is, um, what, what's realistically, what does Syria look like in five years if um, we continue down this path and what needs to, I mean, ideally what you all want? In five years, what would it look like? And and the witnesses can answer briefly, although impossible. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that's, that that's okay. Uh, if you want to direct that, perhaps, Ms. Burchett. Well, why don't you tell me who would be the best one to answer that, Mr. Chairman? That might I'll be. Leave it. I, I'll leave it up to the witnesses you. then. All right. Just the first one that pops on. I'll hit some that, and that'll be it. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you, Ms. Burchett. All right, I'll volunteer as tribute. Uh, it's a nearly impossible question to answer, but I would say five years hence, where Syria will likely be is still a war zone that is contributing more fighters to international wars. I mention that because both the Turks and the Russians are mobilizing Syrian mercenaries to go fight in Libya, Nagorno-Karabakh, Venezuela, and potentially other theaters. Syria will continue to export more violence the longer this war continues. Now, where I would like us to be in five years, if the U.S. recommits to engagement, is that we have stabilized the Northeast, we have realigned with Turkey, 
and there is essentially an arc from Idlib up to the north into the southeast of a zone of Syria that is beginning to recover, that can offer an alternative over the long term to the brutality and violence of the Assad regime. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Richard. It's an important question and response, which is uh, which all gets to the reason that we're holding this hearing. So I, I appreciate that very sure. much. Uh, Mr. I wonder uh, how Vargas, I, uh, Mr. Vargas, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. The first thing I'd like to know is how, how did you mute uh, Mr. Burchett? Tim, I've been trying to do that for a long time. If the technical person could figure out how you did that, you just let me know. I'd love to know that. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, truthfulness, thank you very much for this. Uh, this has been a great uh, hearing. I appreciate it very much. Back in October of 2019, um, I recall a friend of mine who was heard from San Diego calling me being completely outraged because of the decision that the Trump administration had made to uh, remove our forces from Syria and allow the Turks basically to come in and to, to attack the Kurds. And I remember him saying that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains, which is an old term that's used. And I, I do also recall a few months later that uh, the Secretary of Defense, General Mathis, also resigned, and this was one of the principal reasons, there were others, but because of this, and, and again, um, I thought it was tragic myself. I do think that we need to be involved. I do think it's important for us to be there. I haven't disagreed much with others, but I would say this, that not in defense of President Trump, I would never do that, never defend him, but I would say this, that he did say this. I don't want to stay there for the next 40 years, Trump said. I'm not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything, excuse me. I campaigned on the fact that I was going to bring our soldiers home and bring them home as rapidly as possible. Part of keeping that promise, Trump said, is not trusting U.S. forces to even more conflicts that have no end in sight. Quote, we interject ourselves into wars and we interject ourselves into tribal wars and revolutions and all these things that are very, that kind of thing that you settle the way you'd like to see settled. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. And it's time to come back home. Now, I, I think he said that because that was the sentiment of a lot of Americans, just to be frank. I think a lot of Americans feel, you know, why are we involved in these endless wars and why are we involved in places that you know, most Americans couldn't point out on the map if they had to? Um, I don't look at the world that way. I think it's very important if we're not involved there, then we're going to have problems. So, for example, when people now are complaining about all the issues at the border, right, we're having all these, although I live at the border in San Diego, one of the safest places in the United States, you all should live in San Diego. It's very nice. But that being said, it's because of all the problems that are going on in Central America. Europe, too, that's all the issues that they're having, the stuff going on in Syria. So even apart from just self-interest, I think it's the right thing to do, but there's also self-interest for our country. So what really should we be doing? How, how should we be involved so this is not a 40-year war? Um, I, I guess I'll ask, well, actually, who wants to take a shot at that? I don't want to prejudice anybody like the chairman. I thought that was very judicious. I can, I can take a shot. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's, uh, yes. So I think um, the consequences of the U.S. not being involved are dangerous because when the U.S. does, does not get involved, we get Russia involved, right? Let, look at the Syrian case. We did not get the U.S. really involved enough in the case, and we got Russia, and so far we have more than half a million people dead. And the Russian support to the regime in Syria the brutalities that actually created the body of the extremist, you know, part actors in Syria, like ISIS. We just mentioned uh, ten minutes later, uh, before that, you know, the more brutality the people goes through, the more you know extremist parties will show up because they will they will be feeding on the fear, on the brutalities that people went through. So we got to think about the consequences of being involved or not. Um, now I'm, I'm talking like I'm, I'm an American, but um, you know, you know what I'm, I'm trying to say is that the long-term consequences of not being involved gonna be dangerous because let's imagine that we don't get involved anywhere as Ameri and the United States, we don't get involved anywhere. 
and the extremism, you know, grow up. And then that will be in danger in national security. That will be a national security issue for the U.S. anyway. So the U.S. at some point need to be involved again. So stepping out of, of this, the involvement of these nations, gonna, and then, you know, we won't, we won't be able to survive being out for a long time. We got to go back again for our national security, security right? And that's, go ahead, sorry. Well, I agree, and, and one of the things I think you said that's important, I think it, it, it was said well in Les Miserables, that now we see each other plain when it comes to Russia. I think in the last administration, we didn't see each other plain. We didn't see Russia for what it was, um, and now we do. And, and I think that's important. Now, I, I want to say that um, not for everybody. I got to tell most of my, my Republican colleagues saw Russia plain, but I don't think the administration quite did. Um, so again, thank you. My time is up, so I won't ask another question. I did have more questions, but I, I appreciate your answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vargas. Mr. Stubbe, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions are for uh, Ms. Caffarelli. Um, Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen has acknowledged that she plans to pursue a general special drawing rights allocation at the IMF that would provide billions of dollars to genocidal regimes and state sponsors of terrorism. Under this plan, China, Russia, Venezuela, Iran, and Syria could receive $70 billion from the IMF. In particular, under Syria's quota in the IMF, the Assad regime would receive at least $390 million in the upcoming allocation. A recent guidance issued by Treasury even admits that, quote, some countries whose policies the United States opposes will receive an SDR allocation. Do you believe the Assad regime in Syria will use such funds for COVID-19 relief, or, you th or do you think such aid will instead be used to prop up his brutal regime? Thank you, sir, for the question and for the opportunity to answer categorically, no. The U.S. should not provide this aid to the Assad regime, which will be used to repay the war criminals that have prosecuted this war, and it will be used by Assad in an attempt to shore up his position uh, as my colleague Lena mentioned, ahead of what will be a sham presidential election this summer in Syria. Thank you. Well, and I just don't understand why we're even considering doing this. Um, I, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Is there anything else that you think that this money would go to? I mean, do you have any idea? Well, I, I think the intent behind the money is, of course, to provide COVID-19 relief. But the, the trap the United States is in in Syria is that the Assad regime is deeply corrupt and lies, and they will not use the aid for whatever they promised to use the aid to do. And again, as my colleagues have already rightly outlined, Assad has even managed to acquire leverage over elements of the UN process that allocate that aid and that deliver it. Uh, so while I can understand the broad humanitarian principle that sometimes animates these proposals, the reality that we're in in Syria is that this money would reward a war criminal. I wish that weren't true. I wish he wasn't able to hold his own population hostage, but that's why this war has been going on for a decade, because he does it so well and because the U.S. has fallen into this trap before. Thank you. And I agree with you. Uh, at, switching gears a little bit, as of this year, ongoing policy challenges include countering extremist groups linked to al-Qaeda and responding to the threat posed by ISIS remnants and detainees. Iran and its regional proxy military forces maintain and arguably have expanded their influence in the region where they have increasingly come into direct conflict with U.S. forces and allies. Particularly, Iran has bolstered the Assad government in Syria and provided support to the Houthi rebel movement in Yemen, where recently Secretary Blinken delisted the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization. Uh, where are the points of tension between Assad and Iran, and where do you think their interests diverge? Thank you, sir. It's a difficult question because Assad is very in deep uh, with the Iranians. Right now, their interests do not, in my view, meaningfully diverge. At the tactical level, sometimes there is competition between Syrian units and the Iranians, um, and the Iranians certainly subvert Assad regime sovereignty within Syria because they operate outside of his control. However, Assad is perfectly capable and it seems comfortable navigating that dynamic. He needs the military support. He is actually aligned with them on a number of regional issues. I think the question of Israel and how imminent uh, regime desires are, for example, to reclaim the Syrian Golan Heights or, or to conduct that kind of escalation is probably the biggest point of potential divergence. Um, but what we've actually watched is Assad enable Iran's buildup on the Golan. So I would offer, even if that's a divergence in intended priorities on the ground, it hasn't actually led to that significant uh, of a delta between the two. 
Thank you. Is there a path to ending Iran, Iran's military presence in Syria? And if so, what would that look like? Yes, sir. So I would say ending Iranian military presence in Syria is a long-term goal. Uh, it should be a focus of a future diplomatic resolution of the conflict. But I think in the near term, there is a lot the U.S. can do to first stop the build-out of Iranian influence and then set the conditions to roll it back over time. In my written testimony, I discussed one of Iran's elements in Syria that has gone almost fully unaddressed, which is its social, cultural, and economic outreach at very local levels, including in Sunni Arab majority areas along the Euphrates River Valley that could position the Iranians to have long-term and deep roots in Syria that could actually remain even if the Iranian military forces withdraw. The U.S. needs to combat that. I recommend starting by actually, again, reinforcing the SDF, which is the only other reasonable uh, job provider and security provider in the area. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stubbe. Mr. Keating, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having the hearing, Omar. Uh, our thoughts are also with uh, the loss that you suffered and, and, and everything you've gone through. Uh, my question uh, is this. Announced today were sanctions uh, uh, against Russia. Included uh, among those is uh, uh, sanctioning uh, Eugenie Prigozhin. Uh, you know, and what came front and center with that is his involvement with the Internet research agency, but he's also a principal uh, as well with the Wagner Group. Now, the Wagner Group has been uh, involved in, in uh, I think, uh, using the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, you know, to their advantage. They're purportedly distributing in, in the uh, Syria region uh, aid in terms of uh, PPE, protective equipment, and, and vaccines. Uh, to what extent, uh, how do you view that kind of activity by, you know, this front shadowy uh, mercenary group uh, sponsored by Russia engaging in these kinds of activities? Uh, what should we be looking out for? So I'm, I'm happy to offer a comment, sir. Uh, yeah. The Wagner Group, as you rightly noted, is a key tool of the Kremlin inside of Syria and the broader Middle East. Right now, they are involved in the mobilization of Syrian mercenary fighters to fight, as I mentioned previously, in Libya, uh, at the time in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Venezuela, and now potentially elsewhere. Wagner is also involved in Russia's efforts to extract oil revenues from Syria to fund uh, the campaign of airstrikes, for example, that the Russians continue to conduct against Syrian civilians. And there is some indications that the Wagner group has also participated in frontline fighting, um, which makes them directly responsible for Syrian lives. I think it's essential that the United States continue to put pressure on the Wagner Group and its enablers. I think that should include sanctions on Prigozhin, as has happened, potentially on el other elements associated with Wagner, and should also make an effort to highlight and to disclose the role that this organization is playing in order to deny Putin the plausible deniability that he seeks. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, those sanctions were warranted with his activities, not just uh, in Europe and Russia and Ukraine, but also uh, in expanding global footprint as well. Just a question about uh, any thoughts you might have. You know, there's uh, uh, 2,000 foreign terrorist fighters being detained right now, uh, you know, associated with ISIS. Uh, there's 12,000 uh, militants uh, that are there. The 60,000 associated family members, many women and children, and, and you know, the, some of them are starting to be uh, in any case, uh, let's uh, let's hear what you have to say uh, about that, if you could how that should be conducted, what we should be watching out for, how it's occurred so far. Sorry, sir, I lost my audio for a moment, but I believe that question is directed at me, so I, I will offer a comment. Great. Go ahead. The SDF is a non-state actor that is not capable of performing the scope and scale of the detainee operations that are necessary to handle this ISIS 
detained population, nor to deal with the very complex and actually dangerous situation in the all full camp. Now, I would offer U.S. support has actually enabled the SDF to be surprisingly effective in managing this at the level that they currently are. They actually recently conducted a raid inside all whole, which is a very risky enterprise, but that was necessary to root out a number of actual ISIS elements that were operating within the camp, including, if I'm not mistaken, a recruiter and some financiers, and they found ISIS tunnels. So the situation in all whole is both a grave humanitarian crisis and a huge security requirement. The U.S. needs to address both of those issues. We should be leading an international effort to provide humanitarian aid at a whole that is enabled by a security platform that can ensure uh, that ISIS actually is not able to operate freely within the camp and that those humanitarian aid organizations have the kind of security conditions necessary to deliver their services. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, my time is waning, so I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much, Mr. Keating. Uh, Representative Jackson, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And thank you to the witnesses for your testimony and your answers so far. Uh, the United States taxpayers have contributed almost $13 billion to this crisis over the last 10 years, yet the Syrian citizens still face displacement, starvation, and violence, as we've been discussing. Uh, the United States faces three main threats in Syria. The first, the lingering threat from terrorism, including ISIS and groups linked to al-Qaeda. Uh, second, the political and ethnic division streaming from civil war that is now in its 10th year. Uh, and lastly, we would face the problems from the involvement of foreign bad actors, particularly Iran and Russia. My concerns are toward this last of the three problems, and I'll focus my question on this. Specifically, I'm concerned about the undue influence that China and Russia hold in this crisis, particularly when discussing this conflict in the UN Security Council. Ms. Caparella, I think I'll direct this at you, if you don't mind. Can you discuss how Russia takes advantage of the UN system and its permanent seat on the UN Security Council? to help the Assad regime and inflict suffering on civilians? Yes, thank you for your question, sir. This is very important. Uh, the Russians began manipulating the UN by essentially leveraging their veto power in order to ensure the international community could not apply greater pressure on Assad. But what the Russians have started to do is to try to repurpose UN processes to actually actively enable Assad's consolidation. That's what we're seeing the Russians do while they try to shape the diplomatic process and to change its terms to ones that will essentially preserve the regime. And we're also watching the Russians do that now with humanitarian aid. As I referenced earlier, the Russians are trying to give Assad a monopoly on humanitarian aid in Syria, and the Russians are using the UN to do that. Finally, the Russians are trying to discredit sanctions as a tool of American statecraft on grounds that they are inhumane or illegal, which is flatly untrue. But the Russians are also using the UN as a vehicle to do that through, among other things, Putin's demand for a UN summit uh, at which he intends to address the sanctions issue. The United States definitely needs to push back on this. I think a component is, as I mentioned earlier, highlighting the role Russia is actually playing in Syria and breaking through the disinformation that it uses to manipulate actors, including too often European states, to backing Russian proposals that amount to concessions to Assad. But I think the U.S. should also be judicious in what we expect to achieve via the U.N. Security Council, recognizing that we're not likely to get a new resolution, for example, on a diplomatic settlement, um, and we may not even get the resolution we seek on humanitarian aid. We need to block the Russians, and then we need to do what we need to do outside the U.N. to reestablish leverage in this theater that hopefully over time can help us revalidate the U.N. as a legitimate you know, entity inside of Syria. Because one of my fears is that we talk about Assad radicalizing Syrians and Russia and Iran radicalizing Syrians. We don't often talk about the fact that the UN losing legitimacy is also a source of disillusionment and potential radicalization for populations that should be able to trust the UN at the minimum on humanitarian grounds. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I agree with you 100%. Thank you. Uh, one more quick question, and I'll just direct this to you as well. Uh, the Trump administration identified the withdrawal of Iranian commanded forces as a main policy goal in Syria. As the Biden administration develops their agenda for Syria, I hope they're going to continue the same stance. For the committee's awareness, could you briefly describe Iran's military, political, and cultural entrenchment in Syria? How deep do you think their reach and their control currently is? Yeah, thank you for the question. 
The first element of Iran's presence in Syria is its physical military presence that includes the military bases and other infrastructure the Iranian Revolutionary Guards for Quds Force uses, in part to send weapons and other uh, and missiles and other weapon systems uh, to Hezbollah in Lebanon, but also to fuel the Assad regime's war efforts. But it also includes a deeper layer that I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak about further, which is Iran's cultural, economic, and social outreach. That occurs through a number of local charities um, and Iranian-funded organizations, including, for example, the Lebanese Hezbollah Jihad al binna uh, organization, which provides, you know, sort of charitable works for Hezbollah um, soft power inside of Lebanon, is, is also operating inside of Syria. I think it's important not to overstate how deep those social roots are now, right? It's not like Syrian populations that are desperate for basic salaries are fully card-carrying members of, you know, Iran's regional axis of resistance simply due to this outreach. But this is one of those threats where if we give Iran a decade to continue to try to root itself into local communities inside of Syria, that picture may look very different. I say similar things about the risk of al-Qaeda-led, you know, soft power outreach, that people don't believe this ideology, but give them a decade of violence and it may actually start to sink in. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. And I thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, if you allow me, Chairman, if you please allow me to uh, apologize and, and reply to um, to Congressman Mast as I I missed because of technical uh, difficulties. But um, regarding Iran, as was the last thing to to be mentioned, um, Iran is like Iranian are already buying houses in Damascus. They are taking over places. In addition to recent news we got from the ground that Iranians are being Iranian, you know, um, officers being responsible for some prisoners. So they will trade prisoners. Like I was bought out of prison for $20,000. Uh, my mom invested somewhere to get me out of prison. And they are now being responsible in some part of Damascus, some prisons to, to, to be the ones responsible to sell those prisoners. So prisons are economy. More than that, when I was in branch 215, a prison, one of the mo most brutal prisons in Syria, I, I was numbering the dead bodies. And among the dead bodies, I would see ones, they used screwdrivers to draw the Iranian flag on their bodies. They would use whatever hard machines to draw the Iranian flag on their bodies. So the Iranian forces committed brutal crimes against the Syrian people. They actually, you can, you can feel like that they were enjoying doing that. And even in the massacre they committed in May, May 2000, 2013, when they when they killed my 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 family, they actually they, they were there. So the regime was there, supported by the Iranian militias. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say. And sorry again for for um, Congressman Mass for missing his question. Uh, no, appreciate it very much, Mr. Oshodri. Uh, and uh, and thanks, Representative Jackson. We'll now go to Representative Schneider. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Deutsch, and I want to thank you for um, having this hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for uh, spending uh, time with us. Uh, in particular, um, Mr. Oshodri, I want to thank you for sharing your story. It is a story full of, of grief uh, and illustrates the atrocities of, the, of Assad and his regime, but it is also something, a story that is full of um, hope and inspiration, and uh, we're, we're very grateful to that. Uh, I remember I didn't make the connection immediately uh, when you were accepted to Georgetown. The video posted on YouTube uh, was an inspiration to me back in November, and it is an honor to have you here now, and we are so glad to have you at Georgetown and, and look forward to, to great things for you. Uh, in, my, in my time, there's three things I want to touch on, uh, and I'll be brief, but the humanitarian crisis, uh, holding Assad and his regime accountable, making sure that they do not gain legitimacy again, and addressing Iranian in influence. Uh, uh, in July of, of last year, the UN Security Council reauthorized cross-border humanitarian uh, assistance uh, in Syria for a year. Unfortunately, uh, Russia and China uh, had vetoed uh, and restricted it to a single crossing point. Uh, this single crossing point severely constricted aid flows into remaining pockets of Syrian civilians um, in non-regime held areas. The single access point is up for reauthorization this July. And uh, we are hearing that Russia is again considering a veto, likely hoping that the threat of a veto will pressure the U.S. to make concessions in other areas. Uh, Dr. Khadib, uh, how has the reduction in the single crossing point impacted humanitarian assistance? What do you think the U.S. should be doing? Um, and how would you suggest we hold the U.N. accountable? 
Thank you. Um, the UN itself estimates that 75% of Syrians in northwest Syria depend on UN aid. So we can only imagine the humanitarian catastrophe that would happen if that cross-border authorization is not renewed. Um, the US has to exert pressure on Russia at the same time as negotiating with it to, to get it to cooperate. The reason why Russia is increasing the dose of its uh, pressure is because it feels it can get away with it. And that's why it's important not to let Russia get comfortable in Syria. One leverage the US has over Russia is that Russia is hoping that the world would normalize relations with the Assad regime and money would flow into Syria for reconstruction and Russia would uh, be set to benefit from that. Uh, increasing sanctions on the Assad regime and anyone associated with it, whether Syrian or not, would prevent countries from normalizing with the Assad regime, even in a de facto, if not formal, uh, manner. One of the issues that we can also do is pay attention to how the Syrian conflict is really part of a regional uh, picture. It's not just about Syria. It's also about regional uh, interventions by Iran. It is also about what's happening in Iraq. Um, the conflicts are actually quite linked, including economically. And one example I'll give you here is suitcases full of cash are being flown from Baghdad into Beirut airport to fund Hezbollah, and Hezbollah uses that money to fund its own operations in Syria. And therefore, I think when it comes to engaging with Russia to pressure it, using the economic leverage is important, but at the same time, addressing Russia's and Iran's regional role is also very important, which means negotiating beyond Syria, not just on Syria. Thank you. Absolutely, and thank you. And let me turn, uh, Mr. Ostrogri, um, shifting subjects a little bit. Uh, Germany has successfully used the, the thought of universal ju jurisdiction. Uh, they recently sentenced an intelligence officer, a Syrian intelligence officer, to four and a half years in prison for aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. Are there lessons that you think the U.S. can draw from this? Uh, what other countries are doing to investigate uh, the Assad regime? How can we be a better? Um, how can we better promote accountability? I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to to receive this question. I'm glad to highlight it um, that those who committed crimes are actually being followed. Those who tortured me in prison are now some of them are captured and will be you know being questioned or will be questioned. That's really important for the survivors. That's important for the Syrian mothers, parents who lost their kids, who've been tortured, died in the torture, the families of the people in the seizure photos. It's very important for everyone. So we have five legal prosecutions. We have fake cases, legal cases. We have one in Germany and one person is sentenced now. We have one in Swedish, in Sweden. We have one in Norway, in Spain, and in France. All of them are very important. We need one in the US. It's very important. Uh, we cannot ignore the power and the knowledge and the experience the US have in, in this sphere. So it's important we raise. And we try to work with the, with the, uh, the partners that this case matter for in the US. And hopefully soon, Something good can be announced about, about um, legal cases, criminal cases, civil cases against the Syrian regime uh, in Syria. Because you have, it's not just caring about the Syrian people, it's caring about the American people. Because you have Americans who died under torture in Syria. You have Leila Shwaykhani. You have Americans who are being tortured in Syrian detention centers in Syria. You have Asim Tas, Mesh Kamalmaz, and other Americans who, not, who their names are not public yet. So it's important we do that. And when, when the U.S. think about it, it's important to think about their own citizens as well, not only the Syrian people. It will be easier to find evidence regarding the, the, the death, the torture of the Syrian people. And hopefully you managed to watch our the Syrian task force interview 60 Minutes talking about this legal prosecution and supported by our, our colleague Moaz Mustafa and Ambassador Stephen Rabb. It will give more detail about that and the importance and the role the U.S. can play in, in, in legal prosecution. Thank you very much for this amazing question. Thank you, and my time has uh, expired. I, I yield back, but thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing, and I look forward to discussing the issue with Iran later on. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Schneider, and um, I will now yield myself uh, five minutes or so for some questions. Um, I, I want uh, Dr. Khatib, I, I want to ask about uh, Iranian influence, uh, Iran and, and their proxies in Syria, and Turkey's view of that influence. And, We've talked about 
you talked about Russia a lot. Are, are there ways we can coordinate more with Turkey on the common on a common interest in diminishing Iranian influence in Syria? Um, let me start with that. Thank you. Um, for Turkey, early on, Iran was a direct competitor in many ways in Syria because Turkey was seeking the removal of the Assad regime when Iran was supporting the Assad regime. However, things have uh, changed over the years because Turkey's main focus in Syria remains the Kurdish issue rather than the removal of the Assad regime. And that's why I think to get Turkey to cooperate more, whether on Iran or any other issue when it comes to Syria, what needs to happen is uh, governance in northeast Syria that is currently Kurdish dominated needs to become more inclusive and accountable and transparent and effective. Because this is what's going to lessen third tension between the United States and Turkey. Turkey will be able to cooperate more if it feels reassured that there's not going to be a uh, Kurdish led uh, autonomous region at its border in Syria, which is its main concern because it sees that as being an extension of PKK activity um, that would threaten its national security. If it feels reassured on that front, I think further down the line, there can be talks between Turkey and the PKK. But to get Turkey to cooperate on Iran, we need to reassure Turkey about the Kurdish issue. That doesn't mean, of course, abandoning the SDF. It means making the autonomous administration of the Northeast more accountable, transparent, and inclusive of all ethnic groups, and working to lessen tension between Arabs and Kurds more generally in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khatib. Uh, Ms. Caprella, you were nodding. Uh, would, would you just uh, continue that analysis of Turkey and the Kurds, how they're connected in order to work together to, to confront Iran and Syria? Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with my colleague. Uh, and I would simply add that I think the U.S. has undervalued what we can accomplish with the SDF because we have not had a coherent political strategy on the ground inside of Syria. And so it can feel like a monumental task to change the SDF's governance, but we've actually never done that. Um, we've simply allowed the SDF to go forward and build a form of governance that it wanted to, uh, which was responsive to the desires and the political ambitions of the senior Kurdish leadership linked with the PKK. There was nothing inevitable about that. We were passive and we let it happen. If the US takes a more active role I think we actually will find we have common ground with Turkey to advance a common security and governance framework in the Northeast. It'll require hard work. I agree with all of Ms. Khatib's uh, comments about how the U.S. needs to ac accomplish reform, accountability, et cetera, within the SDF. And I would simply offer that I think there's an opportunity here because the Kurdish leadership has been surprisingly um, adaptive and has been willing to make difficult concessions in order to hold on to their project. I don't think this Kurdish leadership will love a lot of the reforms that will need to happen, um, but I think it's entirely possible that they will recognize that it's in their interest to do so. Uh, and I do think that frees up the U.S. and, and Turkey uh, to, to stabilize this area, prevent Iran from continuing to expand its presence there, and then potentially to do more to partner oh. against Iran more broadly. Thank you. Well, okay, to do, how does that, how does that work? So assume we get to that point. What, what happens then? What are we then in a position to do with Turkey vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Sure. So the first thing that happens is that area becomes impermissive to Iran, uh, which is not currently true. The Iranians are actually able to operate in northeast Syria. They're in Hasaka City and they're in other places. So the first thing is to exclude that presence and therefore to deny Iran one of its cross-border access points into Syria because they actually use northeast Syria to get into and out of the country. The second thing I would offer is that it actually opens up regional opportunities and we don't have time, so I won't go into detail, but the Turks and the Iranians are actually on opposite sides of a major flashpoint in Iraq, in Sinjar, just across the border from the Syrian Kurdish area. And that's another opportunity for the U.S. to play a diplomatic role in stabilizing the situation, bolstering Turkey and countering Iran. Thank, thank you for that. Um, just as we prepare to, to uh, close this uh, and really helpful, uh, informative hearing, I, I wanted to I also wanted to talk about going forward and, and what things will look like. And we've, um, we've, I think, acknowledged that Russia and Turkey 
in Iran and, and its proxies um, have played one way or another, have been in the driver's seat, I think, in this conflict. Um, none of them share our general strategic interest in the region. Um, each is using Syria. I think we can agree to advance their own very specific goals. Uh, we can't ignore these parties to, if we want to resolve the conflict and end the suffering. Here's my question, uh, Mr. al we will let you wrap up. At, at this point in the conflict, um, is, as you look ahead, is, is, there a, uh, is there an end in which, uh, in which Russia leaves Syria, in which Iran leaves Syria, in which Turkey leaves Syria, ultimately in which Assad leaves Syria? Um, as you probably noticed, I'm a very optimistic guy. Um, so I, I, I always look at the brightest side possible. Uh, Why I believe... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I believe that, that we actually can find a solution for that. Every country obviously is looking for their own interest, the Turkey, Iran, Russia. Nobody cares about the Syrian people, right? Uh, and that's an obvious thing. But there is always, you know, when the Syrian, when the Syrian people are supported to lead, they're going to lead those countries outside. They will be leading themselves, right? When we have, when we have the knowledge, the experience, the opportunity to lead, we will be leading, and everybody going to be kicked out if they're not doing good for the Syrian people. I know we always have this narrative that the regime actually told us about, that the conflict is serious. It's so complex that it's, it's difficult to engage. It's difficult to do good because you don't know who is good, who is bad. That's not true. We actually know who is good. We actually know who the Syrian people fighting against the regime are the ones that need to be supported. Those one, people who want to demonstrate against the regime, went out to the street asking for freedom with holding flowers in their hands, are the ones to be supported. And they, most of them are in Idlib right now. Would, some people would, would, arg, would argument about Hayy Tahrir al Sham, HTS, but actually the Syrian people, as soon as they got some, some flexibility when they have enough food and water, they would actually be fighting the regime and the other extremist group around because they ask for freedom, right? And the Syrian people paid a lot for that. Lives and money, and they invested everything they had just to get a new country with democracy and representation. And we have the will. The will is very important in this conflict. We have the will. We need the support from the world. And in 2013, when I was in prison, I remember when people started talking about uh, other country being involved to help the Syrian people, and we had so much hope in prison, and the guard himself who was torturing me on a daily basis had so much fear, because he thought, oh, now the world's going to react, going to help the Syrian people in their revolution against the regime, so we may follow the ask in court about our crimes. So I encourage everyone, as an individual and as a congressman, to help the Syrian people, to try to care. And, you know, telling the stories is so important. I focus on that because I know the value of that. That's why you should tell to your kids, to your neighbors, so everybody's aware. When everybody is aware, everybody would care and we would find a solution. There are so many brilliant minds. That only goes from Harvard or Georgetown to work in business. We need those smart people to work in solving conflicts instead for earning billions of money all the time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. al um I know I speak for, uh, for all of my colleagues when I tell you that the, the pain that you've felt in your life, the loss that you've experienced in your life, and the way that you have uh, taken that um, to advocate, not just, not just to advocate for the people of Syria, but to do it in, as you point out, this optimistic way, which recognizes that as long as we continue to pay attention, as long as the world is focused, there, there is a way forward uh, for the Syrian people. Uh, I am grateful to you and all of the witnesses for joining us today, and you have our, uh, our commitment through this hearing uh, and our ongoing focus on this issue that we will not forget the people of Syria. We will continue to press ahead uh, with good allies like you and with the insight of, of uh, talented witnesses like Ms. Caffarella and Dr. Khatib. Um, uh, we're really grateful. This has been a really wonderful and important hearing. I thank all of you. I thank the members who have participated in this hearing. The, the level of participation today, I think, was remarkable.
that shows, among other things, Mr. El Shogri, uh, our commitment to you and to the people of Syria. Thanks, everyone, so much. And with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much for your commitment. This is.